Welcome to the Directing Animation Livecast with Scott Weiser. Now that I'm done directing the development and first episode of the second series of Space Station Animation, I'm joining up with Steamroller Animation to push the boundaries of the art form. Thanks to the support of so many of you, I'm continually developing more than 10 dynamic feature film pitches while mastering the art of telling deeply meaningful stories. Today, my guest is the wonderful Nora Toomey. Nora is one of the co-founders of Cartoon Saloon, also director on Secret of Kells, Breadwinner, and My Father's Dragon that's on Netflix recently. Breadwinner was nominated for an Oscar as well. And she's been a producer also on Wolf Walkers and several other productions there at Cartoon Saloon. And I didn't even, I looked at um, something on your bio that said you were a voice actress. What have you voice acted in, Nora? Hmm. I think my my uh, fantastic career as a voice uh, actor uh, started with sc some screaming on the Secret of Kells. I think I did some uh, some background screaming for like when the the Vikings were invading, um, and I did actually on on Wolf Walkers. I those uh, a very uh, um, downtrodden uh, housekeeper uh, called Bridget who tries to uh, you know uh, basically tells Robin that. It's okay. You just you know keep you know oh, keep yeah. working, and you don't have to think, and just do do your job, and everything will be fine. And before you know it, you'll be very old and bent over in that. Um, so yeah, I I drew on my life as uh, working in the animation industry for that for that role. You did fantastic so. at that role. That that actually stood out to me. The voice acting on that. I was like, oh, that's such a good performance. <laughs> so that's wonderful. Anything else you'd like to add to that uh, bio or correct or? Um. No, I mean, you know, we, we I guess between myself and my partners in Cartoon Saloon, Paul Young and Tom Moore, we we swap over roles quite a bit. So it's great mm -hmm. to be in supportive roles for Tom's films or for you know, Paul has recently uh, stepped into uh, director boots away from um, uh, producing, which he would have done for more than 20 years with us. Um, but even though we would have all started in in animation college and all been um you know all, all drawn uh, together uh, uh, initially um yeah we we kind of step in and out of uh, each other's boots and then depending like you know way back in my early career where we were working on shorts and things like that you would do everything like you would also <laughs> yeah. try and you know finance and try and pull the budget together and the the, the schedule together and that and now um, now we are over, what, we were about 160 people at the moment. It ah, kind of fluctuates a little bit depending on, yeah, depending on, on what's going on. Um, and so we have so many fantastic people working with the finance, you know, crew and we've, you know, accounts crew and we've HR and all of these kind of, you know, official titles that are much, uh, easier than the early days for sure. Yes. In those early days, you know, when you've been through that, you can do so many different things that uh, that it kind of is remarkable to people. And at the same time, you're like, I did it to survive, you know, <laughs> just yeah. uh, we wouldn't you, have finished the have product, project. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. I, I remember with the shorts, like uh, with me and um, and numbers where I'm not to, <laughs> very good. I would easily drop a zero if I was in the middle of budgeting something and I kind of go, OK, you know, so it wasn't it wasn't great. It was out of necessity. Those are those. Uh, early days so it's great that there are people that are much better qualified and better at numbers <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. a little bit better might have oh, might have yeah, uh, yeah. might explain why we were so poor in those days yeah yeah so uh, we had tom on a year ago tom moore and heard his side of the journey i'd love to hear anything about your perspective that wouldn't have been included by tom uh just, just from right. your perspective, how was that journey? He's told me like the details of the you got funding from a bank and um... we did well. I guess yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I what I remember most vividly about the early years in particular. So we started back in in ninety nine, um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Kells I think went into production in two thousand and four. Yeah. Um, and we'd made some short films. So I'd started out with a couple of uh, short films. Some of them you can see on, on YouTube. There's one called From Darkness, which Ooh. I uh, distributed myself. Wonderful. <laughs> with the, the film board backed it, the film board here in Ireland. But I remember mm -hmm. it was like I had I had four or five 35 millimeter prints of this nine minute, uh, nine minute short. And I was trying to organize, OK, if I 
if I see if I can get it into this film festival in France and then get this the, the festival in France to courier it to the next festival in <laughs> Italy or something, then I, I won't have to pay for the courier myself. And so I was, you know, trying to uh, literally, you know, figure out uh, all of that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, the, the baptism of fire of having to do many things all at once, even realizing, oh, if I enter it into this film festival, that means that that film festival won't take it, you know. I know. Yeah, <laughs> did, yeah. Yeah, f figuring all of that stuff out um, as you go, making those mistakes. You know, if somebody tells you that you'll forget it if you have to do it and you realize, you, you know, uh, you realize it yourself, you you remember it forever. And so the strategy of of, uh, of publicizing your film and, and, and that is something that's kind of deeply ingrained, um, you know, no matter what the size of what you're working on is. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the great thing is about making short films is you know, it, it's kind of the same process for the larger films. You know, mm -hmm. you have to write it, board it, fund it, um, you know, <laughs> uh, get the sound done, you know, et cetera. So it's just on a much larger scale. And whereas if you go wrong with a short and if you've, especially I think if you've come out of animation college, you can probably pull it together yourself, especially nowadays when yeah. you can, you know, you, uh, software isn't that expensive and, and, you know, computers are a lot more powerful than they used to be. Um, even if you make a bunch of mistakes, you can still pull it together mm -hmm. uh, with a feature you really can't. And because no. yeah. Kells was was a co-production, it, it was fantastic. The, um, the film board here in Ireland uh, put some money behind it for development. And then the first co-producer who came on board uh, was from Les Amateurs a studio in, in France, uh, Didier yeah. Brunet, who... Uh, was amazing just he he just um had has such a trust in uh creative people and people who really want to get something made no matter what and i think <laughs> that's probably the the most important um feature in a in a director or producer is just that no matter what i you know i want to get this thing made i want to you know i want to make something i want to put something out in front of an audience i want to tell a story yes um it, that kind of conviction is, you know, no matter what else you have, if you have that, then uh, people will, will come behind you and come alongside you and, and get on board because they know they're not wasting their time that you're, you know, that, that you, you fully believe in, in what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and so he was that kind of energy, uh, Didier. And so he encouraged us to find our own, uh, voice uh, voices, uh, at, <laughs> at the time, because, um, I think when, when we were in college and college was great, but it did teach us how to draw in a particular way. And, the, you know, it kind of it was the 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 um, the, the, the syllabus was styled on the Sheridan um, uh, curriculum mm -hmm. at the time. And so we would draw in a certain kind of way. And, you know, um, I suppose originality wasn't something that we really thought about strongly until we started, you know, the, until the studio was up and running and we were trying to kind of figure out how does our stuff look because mm -hmm. uh, you know a lot of studios even now will say okay well we want to be the next disney or we want to you know we we want to yes you know make that four quadrant kind of you know thing in a certain way or whatever um whereas really i think what people are crying out for is originality mm -hmm. you know <laughs> and not, yeah and not not seeing you you know in, if, if you're trying to be like somebody else and you know it's it's hard to uh it's hard to be authentic, I guess. Um, if if you if you find the universal within your own voice, um, then then it's it's more unique. Um, yeah. yeah, I like that so, phrase. Find the universal within your own voice. <laughs> yeah, well, I it, you know I think this is something that uh, certainly um, myself and Tom and Paul really agree on um, about storytelling. Is and I think every every storyteller knows it when you found something deep and truthful mm. um then people really respond to it yeah. but it kind of has to cost you it um, does oh i love that yes <laughs> yeah, it, it you know it, it has to be a little bit um embarrassing or something that 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 people might know something about you you know kind of thing because yeah. uh, you know you, you put something onto the screen and actually it's may, might be related to something that happened to you in your childhood or mm -hmm. or um a flaw you have <laughs> <laughs> And you, and you know that if you have it, then other people have it too. And why we all tell stories is to not feel alone in the world and to, for, <laughs> for us to feel that somebody else has gone through something that, that we've gone through. It, it you know, Stories bind us together. They always have since we were sitting around uh, campfires. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, looking for that authenticity is something. And it's not something we already always 
kind of, we're conscious of and it's not something that we always hit the mark with mm -hmm. um but it is we are you know continually trying for that and and you know um yeah yeah going for it i love that but there's a one of my fr friends who is a in st the story area and he's a brilliant brian mcdonald he often says that storytelling isn't self-expression it's self-exposition you're exposing things about yourself you wouldn't really like people to know but you're doing it courageously knowing that that's going to make a difference it's going to bind people together i love i love how you talked about binding people together that's great well it's interesting because i've been thinking you know ai and all this kind of these discussions about you know uh -huh, AI yeah. in terms of story and in terms of animation and all of that kind of stuff um but ultimately we're appealing to other human beings as mm -hmm. artists and storytellers and animators um and even animator like i remember uh, even on my father's dragon there was a scene toward the end where uh, one of the animators had gotten their uh, grandmother to walk <laughs> so that we could get a certain weight in an older character's um walk uh, and i didn't know that uh, she hadn't uh, told me at the time but i remember seeing it and just uh uh, loving what she had done with it. I just responded to it instinctually because I, that's the way my mother <laughs> used to yeah. walk, you know, and, and I, I, yeah, I don't know if that kind of stuff, like an animator drawing the person that they love and it's studying the way that they, that they, that they walk. And then, you know, me as a director responding to that in a, in a, in a way I can't even articulate just going, Oh, there's something really special about that piece of animation. Um, I don't know if, maybe it will I don't know but we're, we're also we're so highly tuned to understand when somebody's being false with us like mm -hmm. if somebody's saying oh I love such a thing and you know they don't really or uh, yeah. or you know or they're saying something that's not original to them or something you know uh, uh, but yet they're characterizing it as that like, we're, we're, we're tuned to if somebody says I'm fine and you can hear it in their voice that they're not really that we're so tuned to the falseness or the potential fall because it can be life and death, you know, it, it, from a primal kind of perspective as to whether you can believe somebody else or not. I don't know. Maybe we will. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Uh, oh, I. It's it's funny that AI has been so much in the public eye because it's really um it's already been around. We've already been using it, right? I have I type in an email and the email tries to suggest words for me to you know that that's AI, right? It's uh, I actually have a buddy who can program AI and he says that AI is the wrong term for it. It's it's machine learning. You're teaching a machine to learn things, and then it will help you more in brainstorming or more in um. Yeah, more in gathering information and just coming up with really quick iterations. But as far as like the human component, uh, that's the that's the part that you need to bring right to the table. Yeah. So yeah. That that is it, and uh, uh, like good stories, I think, really um, involve that kind of sacrifice and and sacrifice it from storytellers telling something that you're a little bit ashamed of that you kind of don't really want to admit, but you have to <laughs> in order to tell a good story. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if if we ever going to get there with with um you know an artificial way of coming at stories because that's it's never going to cost an artificial being i guess or whatever yeah. um you know uh, to 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 really expose something about themselves i guess i don't know yeah i don't know <laughs> i mean there's kind of a dark a dark thread too there where well perhaps it costs somebody else something and artificial just snatched it and exposed it you know and that's that's kind mm -hmm. of a scary kind of <laughs> You know, it's like I, if, yeah. if I'm going to expose something, I want me to be the one to expose it. You know, <laughs> not not this other you, entity. You you have the makings of a good horror story there, Scott. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have. Uh, that that whole debate has has spawned tons of ideas <laughs> <laughs> for I think a lot of us who are you know generally like I think us artists we we really feel things really dim deeply, you know especially when we're mm -hmm. trying to, we're trying to be vulnerable and honest with our storytelling. And yeah, so I, when I, when I first started seeing that become so big, it really, it really did rock me. You know, I had many sleepless <laughs> nights of thinking about it and like, what, what, what's my place in this? And does my place even matter? You know, and what's, uh, what are other artists going to do? Like Nora, Tom. Um, and I, I also think of, uh, we mentioned, G kids, you know, anytime I see a a studio Ghibli film or a or a cartoon saloon film on the shelf, I want to buy it, even though I already own it. You know, <laughs> there's something about that. You know, there's something special there. And uh, we live in this economy where everybody's seeking attention, right? And mm -hmm. uh, they get attention in quick ways, 
but then there are projects like the ones that we're trying to craft that they can we can bring people back into it over and over again without having to advertise it to them all over and over go again and say hey look at me i have some cool well, thing ai spit out it, you know <laughs> so. yeah no absolutely yeah i think if you do spend time with something and you have the time of you know a couple of hundred people who would have given you know a couple of years of their lives to try and you know help form something that is of meaning mm -hmm. um then that's timeless it really is yeah um, i look at my own my own kids and how um, one of my kids, like since uh, he was three, he's gone back to Kung Fu Panda over and over again. Uh -huh. um, and it means diff different things to him at different um, different times in his life. But he, there's something in it for him. There's something that's a companion for him, uh, you know, in, in his in his life. And that's it's lovely to see that. Uh, to see that uh, how how stories can be a companion to you and how you can see them from different um, perspectives. Um, my, my husband and I were watching um, Sunset Boulevard. Oh, recently. Me too. So now, within a month. Yeah. So yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. So I remember watching it as a student and going, "Oh my God, this is great!" And like, what you know, what an amazing film and beautiful and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But now that I am, you know, probably Norma Desmond's age, I can't watch it because I suddenly <laughs> really identify with her. Whereas before, I was identifying with the young writer going out and you know having it with all these you know, cool friends and everything. Oh and now suddenly I'm Norma Desmond. And I'm going, I can't watch this. It's too tragic. It's too dreadful. You know. <laughs> so I, I stopped halfway through and went, okay, maybe when I'm older again, like uh, older, like if when I'm Norma Desmond's mother's age, I can watch. <laughs> or something but yes. it's funny just seeing seeing the same story from different perspectives either as your skill grows or your experience grows or you're just yourself as a human being grow you know and, and the more experiences you rack up um it's interesting it's I'd, I'd love to have written down what i thought about the film initially so that i could now write down what i think about it you know and and see how my perspective has changed yeah but, yeah oh yeah that's that's amazing there was a film called, um, well, it's in the public consciousness. <laughs> uh, Grave of the Fireflies was a film that I watched. Somebody recommended it to me right as I was about to be laid off at Rhythm and Hughes. And, <laughs> you know, my family had gone to Utah and I'm sitting there watching Grave of the Fireflies of these two children starving to death. And that is not... <laughs> When you're about to be laid off, that is not the film you want to watch. You know, I sobbed. It was it was tragic. And I could not bring myself to watch that movie until this year, you know, mm. and yeah. uh, then watched it. And and it was interesting because now that I'm past that. It was therapeutic, like it, it became one of the sweetest, most beautiful films I'd ever seen, you know, in a way. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's an absolutely incredible film. And I, yeah, I, I don't know many people who can watch it many times. Um, I, I had the similar experience, Scott, mm -hmm. where I, I, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, th there's something, um, very loving in that film in the way the animators give such beautiful attention, um, to everything, every, you know, every single detail. And even though the animation is at times um, what you consider limited, there is mm -hmm. such beautiful decisions into mm -hmm. what, what to show in movement, what to show in a pose. Um, you know, the, the, the compositions are, there's, there's something about um, the style of animation and the, 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 the direction and the decision-making that is that are are kind of loving things um and i there's something again you know particular about the hand drawn nature of it mm -hmm. which is another just an, another element of you know um those scenes that are you know extremely moving mm -hmm. um that that a lot of people spent a lot of time making sure that those moments were marked and so people who lost their li lives at the time when the you know where, where the film was um you know uh, based mm -hmm. and that the, the, that moment in history it felt like uh they were being honored and they were being spent um having time uh spent on them in a way that's kind of distilled and in a way that's not so it's not horrific you know it's mm -hmm. it's um it's oh, like yeah. a distilled experience or something where you can, you know, you can kind of step as far back as you want from it or come as close. And again, depending on what time of your life, if you have, you know, if you have young kids in particular, it's 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 almost impossible to 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 watch. But it's just, it's just the power of it. It's almost like staring at the sun or something. It's almost um, 
it's it's so powerful yeah um, and yet distilled it's it's really yeah i like that idea of distilled yeah um the there's a moment in it that's so small and subtle but uh when he brings her food and she's made all these mud balls and see she says they're rice balls you know that moment really hit me hard and it's so small and so subtle and yet it hits me harder than if i saw a bloody scene where somebody's arm got cut off you know yeah yeah, yeah the way that um uh, it, again it's the observation of how children can normalize extra and the younger they are the more they'll normalize it like extraordinary circumstances and make a little bit of imagination out of it or something you know where um Whereas, yeah, you would think looking from the outside, oh, you know, that child should be expressing that they're really hungry or that they're really, you know, tired and angry or whatever. But no, it's just um, it's it's the uh, that thing that, you know, we all we all played with mud or with, you know, whatever, you know, the, the, the elements and and uh, pretend that there was something else and to see a child in that circumstance. Yeah, you're right. Those are the, the really, really powerful moments and such a. Um, again you know amazing directing to be able to choose something like that and knowing the full power of it you know whether um intellectually or you know from from the heart probably not intellectually probably exclusively from the heart yeah um, uh for in for in order for it to kind of connect with yeah. people all around the world uh, forever you know this is the thing as well i mean that film in 50 years time if we're still around will be uh will be celebrated as much and at that those moments will be experienced in 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 the like the timeless manner that they they are you know that's not a piece of you know cgi from 15 years ago that already looks dated or it's not a um you know it's not a, 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 a you know very now idea that that is you know surfacey or whatever it's it the, the, these kind of you know beautiful um explorations of um, what it is to be human uh, is yeah that, absolutely timeless yeah. I love how you differentiated the mind from the brain, too. I think nowadays, especially I don't know about in um, up where you live, but <laughs> down here, it seems like, uh, yeah, we, we focus too much on the intellect, you know, and that's yeah, there's much more to a human being than just the brain. You know, there's the the, fo the foot, the hand, the, the knee, you know, there, there <laughs> the heart, is. I mean, the lungs, you yeah. know, there's, there's so much. Yeah, I think from a writing perspective, most writers I know do really, you know, go come from the the heart. You know, they mm -hmm. they they really do, and you know, um, I know I know I know like you know the bigger your budget and the bigger the risk for a studio or whatever, like the more voices are going to be involved in a in a in a story, and the more um, the more uh, you need everybody to be kind of you know, walking in the one direction, you know, and you, you want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And even though as a storyteller, you you should, uh, you know, always look for people to challenge you in a positive way. So is that you're not just doing the first thing that comes into your head or you're not doing, you know, something that's been unchallenged, you know, sometimes um, if you're working on something and you might be working on it for weeks and you need to be in a cave, so to speak, in order to kind of get, you know, those first, uh, those first ideas out there and to get those first um, moments, you really do need uh, other voices, I suppose, to come in and and um, give you a perspective on it, I guess, and somebody mm -hmm. else's perspective. But uh, but again, in that in that way that, you know, that you're all kind of speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. um, but you're yeah. right. You're right. There, there can be a lot of. Um, yeah, very intellectual kind of, you know, decisions as to what should happen and what part in a movie and, you yeah. know, and, uh, not another or whatever. Or there can be fear about, you know, trying new things um, mm -hmm. or, you know, going a little bit out there mm -hmm. or, you know, um, you know, Guillermo del Toro talks so much this year about uh, and, and last year about uh, not treating animation as a genre where you have to have a funny sidekick and you have to have mm -hmm. a moment where the character, you know, expresses to camera who they, you know, who they are. And, you know, so to try and pull things away from those kind of um, uh, genre-esque or tropey kind of uh, moments. But then it's funny, you know, audiences can expect that at the same time you know you you you, ha you know you, I, I was um i actually am right across the way from a from a cinema and uh uh you know it's just it's just interesting uh watching films with parents and young children and the i think children will um they, they'll take any experience you know 
um that that and that they'll they'll grow with any experience either stuff will go over their head if you've got nice layered storytelling or they'll engage with it in a way that you're 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 you know that 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 is appropriate for them but oftentimes parents i think can say okay well you know i'm i'm sitting here in this film and there better be something for me so they better have had you know the the voice cast of somebody from my youth so that i can go oh there's that person i can keep interested and in, and the couple of jokes that go over the kids heads and you know yeah. and, and go into my ears so there can be um you know i i think you know people do expect some you know sometimes i think um because of the way that we you know we've watched animation and uh, as a cultural thing in, in in the us and in in ireland and uh, the uk uh and europe uh as well we want you know a certain type of animation for most of our childhoods and most of our our lives and so watching animation such as Graham of the fireflies um uh you know I, i've been to film festivals where uh where uh you know children have been in you know uh, films that they really shouldn't be in just because they're animated they think okay well it must be a kid's film because it's it's animated <laughs> yeah it's, uh, 3d or it's, it's 2d or whatever uh, yeah, that, yeah that makes sense for sure the um there's also an interesting thing about seeing a a, a film alone uh, I think Miami of Tortoro is this way. Song of the Sea was this way. Secret of Kells is this way. Uh, even Wolfwalkers was this way. Um, I saw My Father's Dragon with my kids the first time, so I wouldn't know <laughs> about that one. But seeing it as an adult was one experience. And then seeing it with kids creates a whole new experience for watching the film. Um, the, my Neighbor Totoro in particular, I think that that film was not magical to me until I saw it with kids. And then all of a sudden, it was this completely different film. And uh, that's that's neat. Yeah, they they make it their own completely. You're absolutely right. And what you think is there is going to connect with them mightn't. And it and, and all children are different. And mm -hmm. you know, I remember watching um, the Red Turtle. Michael uh -huh. Dodotto. It's uh, the yeah. the Red Turtle with uh, my kids and uh, their cousins, and um, they all kind of sat down. It was at home, so we we watched it, and they sat down on the couch, and. Uh, the, immediately it started it's the, the film started they began to 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 speak and i was going to tell them shh you know be quiet but then uh, i didn't i just was listening and they were figuring out what was going on with the characters and they oh. were answering each other with it and they were deeply engaged like extremely engaged but they were the soundtrack to the film yeah. there, were, there was a whole and there were times where their, their conversation would fall away and they would just kind of you know watch and then it would it would spark up again um, and it was a, it was like another element. It was like Michael had left sixty percent, even though the film like is 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 it was already one hundred percent for me. But like to it, it, he had left for that. I don't know. It was a magic moment. Yeah, watching, mm -hmm. I just for me <laughs> watching them watching watching the film was incredible. Um, yeah. But he left so much space for them to participate in the film. It was incredible, and I'd never thought of animation really like that. Um, you know. Uh, it's it's uh yeah it was just it was just amazing um yeah, so yeah you never, sounds you, amazing you, my goodness yeah um yeah, me watching it was a, on my own is completely different thing I'd already watched it at that point and went, oh I'm gonna show them and then and then I was going to tell them all just shut up <laughs> yeah yeah with my short film layers it was very interesting I uh, with adults I got these these very different responses um there there were some adults who'd be like I I didn't get it <laughs> there were some adults that were like you're you're playing 4D chess here. This is this is really layered and there's all kinds of cool things in it. And then there were some adults that were just, I like it, right? But with kids, it seemed universally, they just knew it. They knew what it was about. They could tell me what it was about. They were really engaged with it, you know? It was almost like there was there was more of a universal experience with the children than with the adults too. So that was that was fascinating to see. I wonder. Yeah, I guess children, even though they often look like they, they're not listening or they don't look like they're paying attention, whatever they actually do mm -hmm. on a much greater level than than adults, adults often will watch something and try to form an opinion on it yeah. instead of just let it let it wash over them. Um, right. I, we had a similar enough experience when early on with The Breadwinner before it was released, uh, probably halfway through production, we uh, went and took, um, you know, a, a lot of... Uh, uh, students, um, teenagers to to watch the film with their teachers and some of their parents. And uh, I stood in the the, the lobby of the, the, the cinema um, afterwards 
And so the children coming out and they're all talking to each other, you know, uh, and then the adults were, came out with, you know, red eyes and said, you know, I really don't think that's, you know, it, it, it's too much, you know, too much for children. <laughs> and that, but the kids were fine. You know, this is uh, so adults thinking about how a child was going to interpret this or was interpreting it was upsetting for the adult. Yeah. You know, rather than just and again, children. And especially like I said, if, if you're if you're aware of how you're telling a story and aware of how you're layering it, um, uh, then then they'll get what they're able to get in the way they're able to get it. Mm-hmm. Like me with Sunset Boulevard, you yeah. know, there was a whole yeah. level of horror there that I wasn't aware of until I came close to Norma Desmond's age. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's yeah, it's a the story is constantly surprising. It makes me wonder if there's a trick to that a filmmaker can use, not a trick, but a tool that a filmmaker can use to get adults in that space, you know, <laughs> the space where it's like, oh, we're, we're kind of kids again, you know, we can just let the, the film wash over us and, and yeah, have an I wonder. Yeah, and I wonder about, um, I mean, the, and it, it's great seeing actually the cinema that's across the way filling up quite a bit now mm-hmm. again, which yeah. is fantastic because after COVID, we weren't sure what was going to to happen or whether people would be so used to watching things in their living room that they wouldn't want to go back to the cinema but there is that yeah. thing you were talking about earlier that the the shared experience um when you're feeling something very emotional and there's a stranger that's sitting over there and they're feeling emotional about it too and there's something really affirming about it to think that we're both human beings oh, and we can yeah. watch something you know happen with with a character and and both um you know there there's something there's an energy in that um that that is uh that is uh, amazing but i wonder with everybody's concentration spans these days you know i notice myself the amount of you know um you know, my, my concentration span because i'm bombarded with with uh you know things social media and and uh, uh and even choice like so, so much choice mm-hmm. uh i went to see well, i can think of the name um smooth talk a film from the 1980s mm-hmm. i went to see it uh, uh at a festival at uh, virginia uh, virginia film festival last year um and it was the first time in a long time where i'd been to see a film that i didn't really intend to go that somebody else my uh, producer julian um brought tickets uh for it um and uh we went to see it and it was an amazing film uh a story you know a, a really nuanced uh brilliant uh, story <laughs> told in a way like I, I really wouldn't have chosen uh, in a million years to to watch uh, that film I just wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have it wouldn't have uh, struck me as something that I wanted to see um, but uh, it, it kind of made me yearn for a time where you know in this in the summertime you had maybe one or two films that might mm-hmm. might that, that that might come up that you, you know there would be uh, you know something that you want to see or you wouldn't be such a such a you know um you know six or seven films every week that you know that uh yeah what are you gonna watch yeah 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 so um before we do a deep dive into your process um (laughs) we've just been talking about a lot about our favorite stuff (laughs) which is great (laughs) um there's a a person named mona from france an animation student she's just talked about how cartoon saloons or films are such a huge inspiration and thanks you for your wonderful work and wonders what advice you'd give to an aspiring storyteller. Hmm. Uh, thank you for the question. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting one. I, I think there, there is so many, um, uh, just even on YouTube, there is so many different resources, um, mm-hmm. you know, different podcasts out there in terms of, uh, writers sharing their process. There is so many, every year, there are so many interviews out there with different directors and writers and, uh, filmmakers and actors. So you get to see it from, you get to see storytelling from so many different perspectives. I would absorb as much of that as you can, uh, Mona, but I would also, uh, just live, <laughs> I, I think there's nothing just as live. in yeah. just live, like, you know, have live you a know, life. Uh, your experiences, um, take the bus, chat to someone, you know, uh, that, that you might not ordinarily uh, chat to uh, maybe somebody outside of your, you know, the, your usual circle, uh, uh, try and uh, take opportunities. I'm very, uh, as a person, I'm very introverted, but I keep trying to push out the, um, 
but you know push myself out there in ways that I'm I'm not uh that I'm not comfortable with just in order to I feel like if I didn't do that that the, my bubble would keep getting smaller and smaller until mm-hmm. like going outside my door would be it would be an issue for me so uh so I keep pushing that out but then when I do I'm always so inspired just by other human beings um and so just making sure that you uh and you know keeping a journal um so mm-hmm. that if oh, you yes. do <laughs> you know meeting interesting people or you know, even hearing about something interesting on the on the news that you 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 know you might have a perspective on, uh, that you mightn't agree with in a year's time or whatever. Like that, that uh, just thinking as deeply as uh, as you can, questioning uh, as much as you can, writing as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean that's what. Uh, and again, a, a, a lot of writers will you know and storytellers will talk about just doing it. And like as an inspiration is never going to hit you when you're, you know, when you're um um it's sitting you know it, um on a mountain or something like that staring yeah. out into space it's probably going to hit you when you've written something that's so god awfully embarrassingly awful <laughs> that you have to rewrite it seven times and maybe on the eighth time you might get it or when you show it to somebody else and they might say oh well maybe if you try it this way that's <laughs> when it might um start to work uh, so a lot of yeah. it is just uh, writing, try, you know, if if you're a writer, then keep writing. If you're a storyboarder, keep storyboarding. If you're a director or you want to be a director, try and um, try and experience as many different disciplines as you can. And that doesn't mean you have to be a compositor and a storyboarder and a, an editor, but you do have to um, have a, a you know a, a good understanding of of what those people do and how they will how they can help you. Um, and how yeah, and how you can help them yeah. tell uh, the the best stories that you you can. Um, so yeah, just trying to soak up as much experience as you can, and you know, also go easy on yourself. You know, like I said, yeah. it, 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 just it, live. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. Live. <laughs> I think you even you even snuck some advice in where we didn't realize it. Um, don't be Norma Desmond. You know, <laughs> Norma Desmond. If you if you've seen Sunset Boulevard, she was such a scrappy, like really hardworking actress. She makes her mark. She becomes famous. But then when the success is removed, she was so removed from life, she couldn't live anymore. She had to just always look back at the past and, and relive that. And so she was living in the land of the dead, pretty much, you know, for the rest of her life. And yeah. uh, so I, I think that advice, just live. That's really good advice. You know, we're Norma. not we're not live just Norma. here to, to, <laughs> to make stuff. We're here also to experience. Yeah. But that's awesome. I love. Let's do a let's do a deep dive of on, into your process. Like, how would you describe your process of directing a film? Well, it's interesting because right now I'm I'm back at the beginning yeah. and like you know <laughs> drawing a lot. I've got some drawings on the yeah the the notice board behind me and uh, writing and studying again. So I'm gone back to studying uh, uh, life drawing and studying okay. um, screenwriting uh, again. So even though I've been you know uh, doing this in some shape or form for nearly 25 years, uh, you have to keep learning and relearning and always, you know, um, assume you, that you know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because no matter how many times you uh, get into, you know, right, um, you know, the, the whole storytelling process and the more you think, OK, well, the last project I learned this, this and this and I learned that I should do this and I shouldn't do that you're going to make new mistakes on your next project. And, you know, with even the team of people that you're working with, if you're lucky enough to work with some of the people, uh, you know, uh, again, um, uh, you you will, as a, even a group of people, you, you it'll be its whole, whole, a whole other thing. Every film is its own thing. And even though, you know, I remember on, on The Secret of Kells in the middle of it, uh, where it, we were making the film uh, mostly on paper, it was a co-production across uh, a, a number of different countries. So we were shipping paper um, from uh, country to country um, and hoping that it would all come together uh, as a as a film in the end. Um, you know, it, it, it was a it was a difficult process. We, we learned a lot on it. Yeah. Um, the Secret of Kells, I remember we were really interested in because we were growing so much as, as as storytellers, just trying to do that thing of layered story where children wouldn't be, you know, utterly traumatized by the, the climax of the film, <laughs> trying to layer the story in a way where we weren't showing uh, everything that we were kind of um, 
the the, the themes uh, uh, that we were exploring we weren't pushing them all onto the screen in a way that uh, that that uh, that that was going to exclude some of our, our younger uh, audience um uh, so uh, i i guess uh in animation of course the, your screenplay um goes through the the ringer quite a bit in mm-hmm. in animatics so mm-hmm. we, we you know we, we, traditionally here we you know you do about six or seven drafts of a script you think you know okay well this is it this is the, <laughs> the, this is the film yeah. you take it into animatic uh, you know by about halfway through that first pass of animatic you have to bring your writer back and you're saying okay well um you know this thing that we you know looks so good on the page it doesn't quite work when you really start to you know um involve the visuals and make sure that the the visual storytelling is is up there front and and, and central and so you start to try and take the things apart that aren't quite working there um oftentimes while the you know the you're, you you have a team of people you might have um, layout people that are looking to to start on the project you have a storyboarding team that are all looking for uh, briefs uh, and that and you might need to start taking taking the story asunder uh, again we try to work really roughly in storyboard animatic we try not to be um, uh, seduced by the beauty of you know gorgeous panels we like our, our panels and storyboard are working panels um, we do have, you know, scene illustrations and we do have, you know, our art director will have a really good um, handle on how the film looks and how the storyboarding process feeds into the art uh, direction and vice versa. Um, so uh, would we work that storyboard for, you know, uh, at least four or five uh, passes. Um, and again, like usually the, the 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 beautiful storyboards that are left are the ones, you know, are, are the few are few. You know, mm-hmm. on your last pass of your animatic, you've got the scrappiest of drawings. Um, uh, as you as you you know really feverishly work to to figure out that story. Um, I it, it, the um we we'll do like a a temp track of like um um a, a, a voice track before we bring on yeah. our actors just to make sure that we not you know not to be uh, prescriptive for the actors or anything like that. It's just actually to know how much freedom they have. So if your actor comes in, because that's it's it's, it's an expensive part of the process, uh, you also mightn't have great access to your actors. So knowing what you want from them uh, is great. Being able to um, describe it, and especially if you're dealing with younger um, cast members, you do need to kind of know your animatic in your head without having to to uh to to play it uh and you also know need to know um like something that i find kind of interesting with the the storyboarding process and then our voice actors and the physicality that's needed from voice actors even though they're in a like a dark room with a microphone mm-hmm. and, and they can hear their own voices really clearly in their their headphones and that oftentimes even the most experienced actors will get very um um low and intimate with their performances uh-huh. so you have to keep it saying okay well actually um, you're you know, the camera's way over there and you're running now and you know and, and there's somebody chasing you and that's how you know your line is, is coming across but their actors are like big kids they're incredible imaginations um and they're, they're they, you know it really is like playing uh at that point but i'm also really conscious at that point that um you have to bring back performances that the animators can really um jump on as in like the the actors have to uh, the performances that you choose from the actors um, have to be uh, so believable and so good and so truthful that the animators can say, OK, now I can spend a week working on maybe, f- you know, four or five seconds of this and I can give it my all because the actor has also given uh, their all to this. Um, and so your animators are so much of the performance of the characters, of course, as well. So they, 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 the, the voice is one thing, but the the, you know, the physical performance comes from the animators and then your team of animators all working together so if you have a team of animators working on a on your main you know your protagonist that they're all working in a in a collaborative way so that if somebody decides that okay well this character every time they they think about something they scratch the back of their head then that information gets you know uh, followed through to uh, an animator who might be working in a different country who you might never meet um who who uh who can then carry on those, you know, those wonderful gestures, so that, um, so that your character always feels like the same character and not the personality of each animator as 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 it as the film uh, progresses. Um, 
there are so many different stages to animation and there's so many different uh, um, departments uh, and all of these departments have to work together so well. And each department head is head of maybe, you know, 30, 40 people. Um, and uh, we do things called a kind of director's passes where your director and your directing team will just talk with all of the supervisors and heads of departments um, about what's important with each sequence um, as you launch it in production, uh, because it's easy to get lost in the weeds. It's easy to mm. think that something is important, like in 2D animation, if something's happening with the model, you know, that wasn't intended um that can become the focus of everybody's attention but maybe it's not that important because maybe you know the face is important in in that in in those scenes or that's what's carrying the performance so yeah. making sure that your directing team always can um help the heads of departments and every single person working on the film to uh find um uh yeah you know to to spend most of their time on the thing that's most important in those shots in those scenes um and not to worry about things because you know your scenes will never be perfect um yeah. uh, there's always going to be something wrong and your job as a director isn't to you know go for absolute perfection that everything is is right with your you, you're never going to have the money or the time no matter what your budget is I know. to do that <laughs> yeah your your job is to concentrate on on what's important in those scenes making sure that comes across and then you know maybe letting go of the smaller stuff that that means that your team still have energy for what they have to do the next week. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, times, if a director is really unsure, um, it's hard for them to express exactly you know what they want, and it's hard for them to approve scenes because oh, they're yeah. not sure if they have it uh, or or not yet. Um, and then it's also hard for them to gauge how to spend the their um the 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 time and energy of the crew because like you need you need energy for the end of the production you need you know you, you don't know what it costs when you make somebody do something over and over again oh. it's not important oh yes um, <laughs> absolutely yeah, and, you, and and you also need people around you who you can really trust to help you at those times where you might lose perspective uh, uh and to be able to ask them you know you know that thing where the hand is moving you know at the edge of the screen is that important or not or like are you watching that are you watching the character's face and if they say it's really not important then just let it go yeah um so yeah yeah i actually gave a note to an animator this morning <laughs> that i've given them the same <laughs> note and i keep seeing the air there and i was like i'm about to give you this note but i'm not going to because i don't even know if it's th that big of a deal you know <laughs> and uh a little light bulb went on thinking, you know, I wonder if sometimes we just spend so much time, like we might spend 10 hours on this thing that, like you said, is in the weeds when really the overall thing was working. Maybe, maybe we just ignore yeah. that for a while and it won't become important anymore. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a pattern to that. And the more you direct, the more you realize that I, I realize at the end of a production, there's always going to be like one thing that I think is like the biggest thing in the world and it's not and nobody notices just because it. I'm yeah <laughs> and and really what's going on is I'm just not psychologically kind of you know equipped to let go of the project now um mm -hmm. and that that's what's going on so now it now being Norma Desmond's age I'm able to kind of um no, notice that okay that's what's going on now so I just need to stop that now and you know and let it go <laughs> <You know? laughs> um but yeah there there are there are so many um and every director is different and every, you know, director comes, you know, you've directors coming from animation, directors coming from writing, directors coming from editing yeah. or uh, from live action or whatever, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, um, so um, so everybody has, a, has a, a very different approach. And even what is most important to them about filmmaking is different from director to director. Yeah, we have another question from Tito James and he. I hope I said that name. It might be right. Tito. <laughs> it might be Tito. I'm not sure. But uh, he'd like to have us discuss a little bit more about animation not being a genre, but being a medium. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of that comes from like the long history of how animation was formed. It was a very family friendly thing. And now we have several people wanting to push it more like projects like Arcane or to push it more in an adult direction. Um, yeah. Yeah, what well, there there that? always was, you know, there, there, and there always has been animation that has, you know, um, uh, gone in different directions and used uh -huh, the yeah. medium for different types of stories. It's just, yeah, it is just the big uh, blockbuster, you know, uh, four quadrant uh, type of film um, that 
actually even uses the same kind of performances oftentimes like this kind of almost like musical um you know like a dancer like kind of performances from characters that are really uh, pushed and uh, and then other you know uh, directors will use animation for very naturalistic performances um uh, uh, so um i i you know in ways i think because um, because of choice, I mean, you know, we were talking about choice and how much choice there is now. I am happy though to see that uh, even though like things can absolutely get lost in streaming services, um, it, there are some there are so many different choices that you know there there are films that pop up on different streaming services that you might never have thought of clicking on before and you just give it a chance like five minutes and you go oh my gosh I never thought animation could be like this I know uh -huh, yeah. you know I didn't think that I would connect with something like this and I'm you know uh, I, I, I think that that's broadening people's expectations you know even YouTube or you know like you know, even short form you know the, the access back when I you know the, the film that I was talking about with the 35 millimeter print um uh, there is there is so many you know once that film's festival life was over that was it kind of thing whereas now you can make a film. You might never put it into a festival, but you might put it up on a on you know YouTube or something like mm -hmm. that, or put parts of it up on something, and uh, and a lot of people can you know uh, get to see it. Uh, it. So I I think that it's broadening, um, a, a people's expectation of animation. When you think about even you know what animation is, I mean, um, you know, Avatar is an animated film, even though it's not. Uh, advertised as 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 such yet you know some incredible animators worked on it and really honed those you know yeah. incredible performances in massive teams much bigger than yeah, uh, steamroller you know, worked on that <laughs> yeah. yeah several of the artists I, i've worked with have worked on that yeah yeah uh, it's, yeah it's, 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 it's so so this is it you know it's it's like what even is animation you know mm -hmm. or you go to you know any of this everything's films, animation like they're, now <laughs> they're, they're, yeah they're they're 80 percent animation so yeah um so so even what, you know, when people say, oh, but, you know, your film has to have a sidekick and you have to have a magic element and you have to have a song and you have to have, um, you know, if, 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 that's a particular type of thing um, that people are pointing at. And then you get funneled into that if you're making a film that's for kids and for adults. I think I think if you're making a film just for adults and it's a, that's a hard sell because, you know, um, I don't know. It, it, you know, it, 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 it can be a hard sell if you're looking for funding to, but it, sometimes I think it's better just to jump with two feet and just say, okay, my film is, is for adults. Um, the type of design that I'm choosing is not signaling to younger audiences. It's signaling, it's got a sophistication or something um, that's signaling to old, older audiences. I think if you are aware of all the signals that you're sending and then, you know, do that, yeah. um, then, then, then your film is, uh, then no one is going to ask of it. Like Flea, for example, I don't think anybody was asking, you know, in in, in the film Flea, which is about a, an Afghan uh, refugee. I don't think they were they were thinking about um, well, where's the the sidekick and where's the where's the song moment and where's the, you know, where are the gags where where's the gag pass on that, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I don't yeah. think. So I think if your if your signals are uh, are all tonally in the same vein, then no one's going to ask. Uh, that question but i think the more money you ask for and the more the more you're asking for family audiences you are going to come up against uh, that but i think it's being you know reinvented all the time and i think that films like you know spider verse and you know that the, the the uh that that uh that that's being you know challenged as well it's and, and pushing things expectations yeah. yeah there people aren't you know feeling shortchanged if they if you know if they don't get exactly what they think they should get. Yeah, that's, that's um, cool. Yeah. Uh, we're coming up toward the end of this. And my question I usually ask is uh, the get wiser moment. Uh, you actually already touched on this subject multiple times. Um, but the question is, if my goal is to get the highest clarity of truth into a story, what approach would you recommend? The highest clarity of truth. I said truth. I might change the word to meaning. I changed it to mm. meaning last time. Yeah. Yeah, well, I get, yeah. It, uh, mm, I think if you, if you're, if you can really like in an honest as way as possible, like move yourself with what you're doing, you know, uh, and you can, I think you, if, if you hit it and you feel the power of it, um, then 
uh, and if others feel it too, like if, and again, you have to be careful with who you, especially <laughs> with animatics and things like that, you have to be careful with who you ask uh, advice from and make sure <laughs> that there are people that are in the same sensibility as you. They don't, yeah. like, they don't need to be in animation or whatever, but they do need to, um, because, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, situations where you get like a whole bunch of directors into a room and they're all like, well, what I would do there is yeah, I do this I and do. I do that. You're not going to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they're not actually. The worst advice. <laughs> it's what you yeah, would do. They're so. not actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. They're just, you know, proving how clever they are as opposed to kind of helping <laughs> you with the story that you're telling or understanding what the story is that you're telling. So oftentimes the best people to ask are editors and writers and people mm -hmm. who are um, actors, you know, people who are uh, used to kind of working in a very collaborative uh you know that it's not it's not you know that you're not asking auteurs I guess yeah um uh, and then I think Meg Lefauve who's that the, the writer on on my father's dragon was saying that you have to be careful who you ask permission for because some self-sabotaging thing that you can do when you come up with an idea is tell the person first who's going to knock it down <laughs> so you don't have to do it and it doesn't have to be a failure you know <laughs> Um, so I thought that was it was really wise uh, as to like just being careful of yourself. You just don't, you know, don't, um, you know, I, I and again, like, you know, through my career, I've, I've met people who said, well, I would have done this. You know, I would have followed this career path, but somebody at some point told me I shouldn't or I couldn't. Yeah. So I didn't. I'm going, well, but they don't have power over you, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and not that, you know, like people, you know, are, are, are wounded for different reasons. And, and oftentimes people ask um uh others for 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 permission and they don't need to um but but yeah so the truth i think you'll feel it and then uh, the thing is is that when you when you do it's probably going to be really scary uh -huh. because again you feel exposed <laughs> yeah like oh no and you know um that, that 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 this is something i don't really want people to know um, yeah. and they'll probably see right through and they'll go oh my god that's because you you know so uh but then yeah, just being really courageous yeah but being courageous with that yeah. Because um, if you're able to touch that moment within yourself, maybe it's coming from something that happened to you or somebody that happened, something that happened uh, or, or something that you, like I said, something that, that you're maybe not that proud of or whatever in, in <laughs> yourself, um, others will respond to it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as well. And even so your audience will, but your team will too. If they know that the story that you're telling has cost you something, then they they'll say, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to spend this year working on that then, because if it costs you, then I can trust you. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it, and I think, uh, I think if you have that and just hold on to it yeah. because it's, it's really lightning. It's really, it's really, you know, it's difficult and it's difficult to hold on to and it can be destroyed so easily. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, um, uh, and you have to be, but you also have to be prepared for that. It might not work. You might feel it, and you know, you have to just go with it uh, uh, anyway. You know, and and uh, if you if you succeed, you succeed. If you fail, you fail. But you just have to, you know, get up and go again and be resilient. You know, just follow your passion. Yeah, that's great advice. I love that. Also, when showing it to people, um, I had an experience this week where I had just sent it off to a potential deal person and <laughs> and uh and then I, immediately i could see what was wrong with it and so i went and showed it to some people and all they told me was oh it's great i love it <laughs> but i was like mm, i'm gonna change it anyway <laughs> so i went in because i could just feel there was something not clicking in the honesty area about it and uh, then showed it again and it, it actually did click better with the people wow. you know so you have to really listen to that so yes. that's amazing yeah. advice. Wonderful advice. Yeah. Yeah. And not listening. I mean, again, because like if you ask for notes from everyone, you'll get notes from everyone. But if, if you're getting the same note a lot of times or if if there's one that really kind of, you know, you might first say, oh, no, that's all completely wrong. And why I did that was, you know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But then that night you're thinking about it still. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? Those are the ones that you have to listen to, the ones that kind of haunt you and that follow you around. They haunt um, you, yes. Yeah, Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, is there anywhere you'd like people to engage with you or your work at the moment? Well, I, uh, well, Cartoon Saloon, uh, we have we have a number of things coming up. We have um, Screechers Reach, the uh, Star Wars Vision short is coming up on uh, uh, May the 4th. Oh, nice. Uh, uh, yes. On Disney Plus, we have a number of, you know, projects in development. We have a preschool show that's in production uh, uh, uh that's uh, uh called city sundays for hbo max we have uh we have puff and rock which is a preschool show which is um 
uh, a beautiful um, a feature film, which is going to be released in Ireland uh, this this summer. Um, but so just on Cartoon Saloon, social media, um, Instagram, you know, Twitter, et yeah. cetera. And uh, those links are all down there. in the bio in the show notes. So great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. And until thank next time. Much, yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> until next time, I hope we all get a little wiser. Thank you for watching the Directing Animation Livecast, hosted by Scott Weiser, audio version edited by Kira Horowitz, copyright Scott Weiser, LLC 2022. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and ring that notification bell.